Minister of Culture and Sport, Lena Adelsson Liljerup, knows how to play chess. In this week's episode, we'll show an interview with the minister where she talks about chess in media, the chess olympiad and much more. In the opening school, we continue the analyzing of the can variation. A report by Macaulay Peterson from the penultimate round in the Nanjing Pearl Spring Chess Tournament. In the chess puzzle, we'll go through a chess puzzle with checkmate in two moves. And Professor Dr. Arne Johansson takes us back in time to 1867 and tells us about an interesting article in the New York Times. Vi vill inledningsvis gratulera till det förlängda förtroendet som kulturminister. Vad kan man förvänta sig av kulturministerns politik under de kommande fyra åren? Jag tror inte man ska förvänta sig enormt stora förändringar jämfört med den politiken vi har haft under de fyra år som har gått. Så att det vi tycker är viktigt och det vi fortsätter att arbeta med det är att barn och unga ska få större rätt till kultur och möta kultur och själva skapa. Vi har ju också det här som vi talar om kulturarvet som är en stor fråga och som handlar om också våra rötter. Och det finns ju också inom schack, vi pratade här alldeles nyss om att också ha kunskap om schacks historia betyder mycket för det är också de som spelar idag. Så att kulturarvet, våra rötter, vår historia är viktig. Den nyskapande kulturen, det här som ibland kan vara kontroversiellt men som också finnas, hur kan vi bättre stödja den? Det är frågor som vi kommer fortsätta arbeta med. Schack Sverige är helt uppbyggd av ideella föreningar så i syfte att fler föreningar ska erhålla sponsring väntar vi spänt på den stora sponsringsreformen som ska möjliggöra en ökad efterfrågan att sponsra föreningslivet. Kan vi vänta oss en skärsättning av reformen inom en snar framtid? Jag tror inte att sponsring kommer bli avdragsgilt så som en del föreställer sig att det ska vara. Men det är viktigt att säga också att det är inte är förbjudet att sponsra kultur. Många tror ju det. Att det bara går att sponsra idrott. Och så är det inte. Egentligen är det ingen skillnad. Men och om man sätter sig in i reglerna så upptäcker man att det finns goda möjligheter. Sen ska vi också, eftersom jag nu får tillfälle att prata om det, säga att när vi pratade om behovet av sponsring tidigare var det under en period när vi fortfarande hade hög förmögenhetsskatt, när vi fortfarande hade arvs- och gåvoskatter, när vi hade höga inkomstskatter. Och sen vår regering kom till så har ju mycket av det här förändrats. Förmögenhetsskatten är borttagen. Den förra regeringen tog bort arvs- och gåvoskatten. Vi har sänkt inkomstskatterna. Det finns faktiskt väldigt mycket pengar i samhället. Och det ska vi också tänka på att de möjligheterna som man tar tillvara. Så att sponsring finns, men jag tror att den kan utvecklas. Men det handlar om att hitta nya sätt att möta och berätta att man också finns. Så ministern vill uppmana näringslivet att sponsra kultur? Ja, i allra högsta grad. Eh, nu är ju schack någonting som ligger mellan kultur och idrott. Och jag vet att ni har sponsorer och många företag tycker ju gärna att det är lätt att sponsra idrotten. Och jag tror att man skulle kunna få fler företag att sponsra kultur också. Men det är ett arbete som vi har som ligger framför oss och det är väl en av de frågor jag också vill jobba med under de kommande fyra åren. Det fantastiska med schack är att alla kan spela schack. Kvinnor som män, barn som vuxna, oberoende av utbildning, etnisk ursprung och språkskillnader. Schacket är en frizon var alla kan mötas och över 3 miljoner människor i Sverige kan spela schack. Vad tror ministern det beror på att schacket inte fått något utrymme i public service-medierna? Ja, det kan man ju sannolikt fråga sig. Jag vet att det är många som spelar schack och betydligt många fler än de som är medlemmar i schackförbundet. Man har väl sina egna kanske kanaler, det kan vara öppna kanalen som vi medverkar i idag. Det finns ju speciella tidningar, man byter tips på internet. Eh, och jag vet inte, har ni pratat med företrädare för public service, för radion eller tvn och vet att de ska göra program? Jag vet inte, men mycket handlar om att kanske ta kontakt om de inte själva kommer på idén. Så lycka till med det tycker jag. 
År 2005 fanns det långt skridna planer på att arrangera världens största schackturnering, schackolympiaden, med cirka 300 landslag i Göteborg. Tyvärr så blev det aldrig av, men hur ser ministern på ifall ett sådant stort evenemang som skulle samla hela världseliten skulle arrangeras i Sverige? Det vore jätteroligt. Varför blev det inte av den här stora schackolympiaden som man hade planerat? Jag spelade lite schack när jag var barn. Mina egna barn har spelat schack. Och jag har en bror som spelar schack. Och de jobbar mycket med, också med schackdatorer så man ska ha en, liksom ska jag säga, en riktigt skarp motståndare. Jätteroligt. Därför att det som ju brukar framhålla bortsett från det här med tävlingsmoment och att det är roligt att vinna så handlar det mycket om det här med koncentration. Och det är någonting vi ibland är det brist på i det här samhället. Så att jag önskar verkligen er alla framgång och sen ska se om jag så småningom får mer tid eller kanske den tid man ska ta sig och lära sig det med schack igen. Det kan vara någonting jag också skulle behöva, det med koncentration och skärma av och ja, tänk, ägna mig åt lite grann andra former av strategiska lösningar. Det Kul att ni kom! Tack så mycket! The Full English Breakfast is the chess podcast with EM Lawrence Trent and Grandmaster Stephen Gordon, produced by Macaulay Peterson. Each show, the trio wax philosophical on the issues of the day in the professional chess world. This is how the creators describe their show. The Full English Breakfast started life as a late night brainstorm at the 2009 Gibtel, now Tradewise, chess festival in Gibraltar. Trent and Macaulay struck up a conversation about things missing in the chess media and hit upon the idea of doing a podcast combining the serious with the slightly sophomoric. Trent quickly brought in his pal Stevie G, dramatically raising both the intellectual and the dialectal heft of the new ensemble. And the rest, as they say, is hysterical. Visit thefeb.com and make your own assessment. Last week, Macaulay Peterson reported from the Nanjing tournament where the world's top players were fighting for the $80,000 first prize. With one round left, Magnus Carlsen won the tournament. Here is the report from the eighth round from Macaulay Peterson. In Nanjing, after round nine, where we already have a winner, Magnus Carlsen bested Vesel and Topalov with the black pieces today to solidify his spot at the top of the standings and the world rankings. Please. Thursday's round eight was a quiet one, as all games finished early and all were drawn. Luckily for the fans, there was also the game between Anand and Topalov. The two fought out a complicated Catalan, in which both players were having trouble remembering all the theory and the right move orders. Topalov's knight sacrifice on F2 was a Bulgarian special. Uh, the sacrifice I made was uh, prepared by, uh, as usual, Chuparino and, uh, and me. It's an interesting idea the, to just sacrifice the knight with knight g4, knight takes f2. It's a very drastic solution. Um, I remember um, it was quite uh, dangerous for white. After black sacrifices his knight, he's very close to um, get a good composition. Um, the only question is towards the end whether I could have played queen d4. I think probably I should have. Um, somehow I, I just have missed something after queen d6. Um, my king somehow escaped the checks, but I, I can't remember how I did this. And uh, in fact, uh, I just have to agree to a draw immediately. In the end, Anand realized it was too dangerous to avoid the perpetual check. That brings us to today, when again two games ended in relatively quick draws, leaving Topalov, whose form clearly wasn't there against Carlsen. This time around, when Black's knight landed on f2, it was a crusher. He blundered, um, which actually I kind of anticipated, but I don't know exactly why I thought he would fall for that. Okay. Topalov played on just one more move before throwing in the towel. 
Just like yesterday, Bakro drew his white game rather quickly. Yesterday it was Gashimov, this time against Wang Yue. I know it's draw, but uh, okay, after uh, Blender in, uh, against Topalov, I just wanted to make draw. I just played for draw with white, which is not too difficult yet, actually. But uh, yes, of course, it's difficult to play after uh, just blundering in one move. I became very pessimist, too much pessimist after my uh, bishop c5 move against Topalov. Tomorrow it's uh, much more easy because I play black against Vichy, so all I have to do is to play good and equalize yes? It's much more easy than with white. <laughs> we know for what we play. So. Vugar Gashimov repeated Carlsen's recipe of 5 rookie 1 against the world champion's Berlin defense. After the draw, the Azerbaijani grandmaster didn't claim he had an advantage, but he said it was easier to play for white, while Anand was quite satisfied about the way he solved his problems tactically. So Carlsen puts it out of reach with a round to spare. Afterwards, Magnus, tired but happy, took questions as the repeat winner of the third Pearl Spring tournament. I'm uh, very happy to have won the tournament, especially since I've been playing uh, a lot over the last month. And um, yeah, uh, things haven't gone too well for me. Uh, so I'm very happy that uh, it's gone so well here and um, well, I'm very very tired now but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. but most, most of all very very happy to have won. Number two and three in the tournament, Bakro and Anand will face each other in the last round on Saturday morning. In Nanjing, this is Macaulay for Chess Vibes. we ended our analysis of the can variation in this position. And with the purpose to allow everyone to find their way here, we will quickly go through the moves leading us to this position. White begins with e4 and now follows c5. Knight to f3, e6, d4, an exchange on d4, a6, bishop to d3, bishop to c5, knight to b3, bishop to a7, queen to e2, knight to c6, and bishop to e3. Last week, Alfred told us that, that earlier an, an exchange on e3 was considered the only playable move in this position. But nowadays, other moves have been accepted as well, such as knight to f6, d6, and knight to e7. Alfred, how will the game continue on from here? As previously said, black has some moves to choose from here. And let us begin with bishop takes on e3. White is here supposed to recapture with the queen. To take back with the pawn instead is not recommended since that only leaves white with two weak isolated double pawns on the e line. For black to play e5 with the plan to cover the center squares, hinder white from playing e5 taking over the d6 square and to hinder a white f4 is not recommended since this will leave the d-pawn behind. Instead, black should play d6. This is followed by white's knight to c3 and knight to f6, castle queenside and castle kingside. The position which has occurred gives white a minimal advantage. In most cases in the Sicilian, where the kings have hid themselves in different corners of the board, a quite aggressive game will develop, where white storms the kingside with his pawn while black will push his a and b pawns against the white king. Let us now go back to our original position and let us see what happens after an early knight to f6. White can here take an a7, but I recommend white's developing of the b1 to knight to c3, and against this black is to play d6. White is in this position castle queenside, and black goes to direct attack by playing b5. White is here supposed to take on a7, which after black recaptures with the rook. 
Note that the Rook on a7 can have multiple uses, depending on its future positioning. It can thereby act as both a defender and an attacker. White does here play at the quite obvious f4, and black has to be careful with his next move. Usually black plays queen to c7 in this position in order to hinder black or white from playing e5. But this is not to recommend since this move will look, lock the black rook to a7 and break the pieces coordination. That is why black needs to play e5 here. But that does not work either right away. This since it leaves the hole on d5 square which is perfect for the knight on c3. Black must firstly play b4 and threaten away the knight on c3 before e5 can be played so that the holes emerging in the position might not be used by white. As previously said the game will develop by white attacking on the king's side while black attacks on the queen's side and the one who manages to balance his defense and attack the best will win. But with that we end our analysis of the can variation. Next week we will analyze a new variation, so see you then. Now that you have had your weekly dose of chess opening strategies, it's time to polish your tactical finesses. Well, it's just easier to admit that opening knowledge may be very necessary, but how much help would that be if you wouldn't be able to finish the game with a checkmate? Therefore, it's good that we now will challenge ourselves with a chess puzzle and this position could definitely appear in one of your own games. It is white that checkmates in two moves. The puzzle is easier than you might think at a first glance. You have one minute to figure out the answer and use the time wisely. Good luck! Well, from a material point of view, this position is fairly equal. White has a pawn war, which could be a great advantage in a pawn endgame, but in this position, it does not really give white the upper hand. No, it's our positional advantage that we will have to thank when this game will end, which is in two moves. And what are the moves then? Well, it actually looks as if there is a checkmate on the 8th file here, by example let, letting the rook go to e8, but as you all see, there is no checkmate after that move in just 2 moves, but there is a checkmate in 3 moves. I would also like you to note that if we don't perform a checking move here, black will checkmate us at the once by capturing our rook on e1. So we need to perform checking moves which forces black to play as we want him to play. Be sure to keep an eye on the whole board and make sure that you haven't missed the bishop on a2. If you would have, you wouldn't be able to find the checkmate in two moves. Because this variation actually is depending on the bishop here. Since the rook move is out of the question and also a queen sacrifice, we'll take a look at the last standing checking move which is rook to h5 check. Well, the king can't go anywhere, so the pawn is forced to take the rook. The thing that's new in this position is that the bishop diagonal has opened up and that the queen has more play space now. The best part is, however, that we can capture the pawn with the queen, resulting in a checkmate. The bishop guards g8 and the queen takes the entire h line, so black is thus checkmate. Well, you're just getting better and better and these chess puzzles seem to become easier for you. I would consider whether we should solve a chess puzzle in checkmate in 3 moves next week or not. Until then, be sure to practice on your own. I want you all fit for a fight next week.
In the case of old chess news, it might be interesting to occasionally go back to the daily newspapers. So today I will talk about an article in the New York Times, but the article is not exactly new. It appeared in the newspaper on Sunday, August 18, in 1867. We can regard this time as part of the chess childhood era in the United States. Morphy had already made his success in the first American Chess Congress in 1857 and caused a chess fever across the continent. But chess activities died out to a large extent in connection with the Civil War during the first half of the 1860s. And it was not until 1871 that the Second American Chess Congress was held. There were still some chess activity worth reporting in the American daily press. And the article I thought I'd mention here was published in the New York Times in 1867 and contains two separate reports. The first part looks like this and involves a chess game between Detroit and New York, fought by telegraph. It was not the first game of this nature. Three years earlier, for example, the Philadelphia Chess Club played a telegraph match against the Paulson Chess Club of New York. In the game of 1867, the New York side relied heavily on Captain McKenzie, who was perhaps the continent's strongest player at that time. He accepted a draw offer from Detroit in this position, although he felt that New York's position was clearly advantageous. The article includes a suggestion for how White should have continued, but Fritz Eleven thinks that Black has a very slight advantage so Mackenzie probably took a correct decision to accept the offer for a draw. A little further down the same column it is reported that two American chess players participated in the chess congress and tournament in Paris. One of them was Eugene Rousseau with his roots in New Orleans. The article quotes a London magazine that wrote, 20 years back Mr. Rousseau was a player of some renown and made an honorable stand against Mr. Stanley, then the champion of America, and goes on to indicate that he had passed the best before date. In the Paris tournament, he managed, after all, to win five games, but lost 19. During Morphy's first years as a chess player, he played a large number of games against Eugene Rousseau, and one of them from 1849 is preserved in Marox's book on Morphy. The other American in the Paris tournament was the famous problem composer Samuel Lloyd from New York. In Paris they had organized a problem composition tournament with many participants and Lloyd won the second prize. In the regular tournament his result was only slightly better than that of Rousseau. Lloyd took six wins and one draw. Rousseau, on the other hand, made a decisive contribution to the tournament result by defeating the strong Polish player Winover, who thus slipped down to second place behind the ultimate tournament winner Kolisch. The second place in the tournament was shared with none less than the then young Willem Steinitz. We end here today and we'll return next week with a new theme, so see you then. We are back again next week. Then we will show you a report from the last round from the Nanjing Pro Spring Chess Tournament and much more of course. So don't miss that and see you then. Bye!